well. Good morning, Walnut Grove Christian Church. Um, if you guys have your Bibles, could you pull them out to Acts chapter 9? And while you do that, I'm going to pray. Um, Father, I come before you humbled. And I ask that as I preach this morning, um, would uh, the members of the congregants here not come away thinking, that was terrible or that was great. David is awesome. But more, would they just be excited to read your word, to study your word, to take part in the mission that you've called them to? Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, Aaron, he, he did get me. But <laughs> if you don't know who I am, um, David Thompson, my wife, is in the white dress in the middle over here in the back. And my parents along with her. And I've never preached before, so it's kind of a little... You know, intimidating, um, you would say, especially coming back to your home church. But as he mentioned, I uh, went to the Sunday schools. You know, I went to the youth groups. I went to the children's church. And I did all those things with my partner in crime, Landon Hushauer. And as I, probably, as I say all those things, Jay, Norma Jean, Carol, probably having war flashbacks as we are, <laughs> as I'm speaking that. Um, but as I'm your guest preacher this morning, I'm, and I, as I tell you about my ministry, um, I'm just excited to speak through chapter 9 in Acts and following, and so we're going to get started. But I don't know about any of you guys, but I'm a uh, sucker for a good story. Um, I love books, I love movies, I love TV shows, and if you guys don't know, in a few weeks, Indiana Jones 5, Dial of Destiny is coming out, and I loved Indiana Jones. (laughs) I loved Indiana Jones, probably because, like, dad as an influence, but also because... Man, it was good. It was historical fiction. If you don't know who he is, he had like a famous hat and he was he had a whip when he used it in fight scenes. And the thing is he was a famous archaeologist and what he did was he just wanted to collect the most famous of antiqu- antiquities and bring them back to his friend in a museum. Okay? And the thing about the story that I love so much is that one, it's hist- it's history, it's historical fiction, but it's history and it's a good story. And I'm a sucker for both. But as we get to Acts chapter 9, we're going, to be going, we're going through history, but a real history. But it's also a great story by a master storyteller in Luke. And so the context of Acts is I want to give you a little bit about the author and a little bit about the story that the author has portrayed. And then we're going to get there. And I'm going to do all this in 30 minutes. And then you're going to have seven minutes about my ministry. So for, for you who are wanting, you know, your complaints about David at Sunday, Sunday brunch. There you go. There's the details. So um, the author of Acts is the physician Luke, not one of the disciples of Christ. And he wrote the gospel of Luke. And so you have Luke, Acts. Luke wrote the gospel of Luke, and it's a story of Jesus' ministry about his life. And he's writing it to Theophilus. We don't know much about Theophilus, but what we do know is that Luke is writing to him, and he's writing to Theophilus to make sure that he has, he's a certain of the things he's been told about. Okay? And that's part one. Luke, the gospel of Luke, authored by Luke. And then you have Acts. And Acts is the message of the gospel by the Spirit of God, and it's being spread throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay? And so, what's happening is Luke was not an eyewitness himself in the Gospel of Luke. He, he wasn't around Jesus. He wasn't around Jesus' ministry. But he, he was like a collector. He was a storyteller. He was writing all these things down like a reporter. And, he was, and people were coming to him, telling him all these stories. And he's like collecting them, putting them together, writing them down, and like putting them into a story. And as you guys have already heard, I'm a sucker for a good story. And then you get to the Gospel of Acts. And he's not, he's there for almost for a little bit of it, actually. He's a companion of Paul, he's a companion of Peter, and he, you see him mix himself into the story, but not like he's like a main character, but kind of like one of the background characters. He just he sprinkles it in there. He puts like us, puts we, sometimes I think he put I once or a few times. Like he's in the story, but mostly it's eyewitness accounts that he collected from somewhere else. And so again, we see Luke is basically collecting a lot of stories. He was there for just a little bit, and he's writing a story, a good one. So that's the context of Acts. Luke is writing it, and we're getting to get the story most likely from Paul, who we're learning about today. But as we get, we get to Paul, we, you also need context. I was, I was an education major, if you don't know, which means I'm, I'm a big review guy. Because, you know, if, if it's repeated, it's going to be intake, and it's going to be learned, it's going to be congested, and it's going to be applied. But anyway, so we're now we're going to get to the story in the, of the series, the context of the series. We know the author. We know what he's trying to do. He's writing a story to Theophilus to make sure that he's certain of what, about what he has already heard. 
Okay, now we're getting to this, the series that you guys are doing here at Walnut Grove. And that is Acts 1-8, as you guys are going to see, is the summary of Acts. And it's Jesus, and he's saying this to his disciples. He says, but you... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so what you're seeing in the book of Acts, as Luke is writing part two of his master's story, is that we see that God moved forward his plan of redemption through his people led by the Spirit. God was not done with the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. It was the beginning of it. Through the book of Acts, we see these key figures from all walks, all backgrounds, and, and types. And they're engaged in not God's new kingdom, and that was being ushered through God's new people, the church. So people like you and I, God used people like you and I, messy, sinful, imperfect people like you and I, to usher in his kingdom. And you're going to see the gospel is being spread forth in Acts 1-6 through in Jerusalem and Judea. And then, as we're learning about today, as you learned about in the last few weeks, it's, it go, goes to Samaria. And it's in Acts 7 through 9. And we're going to see later on how Paul is bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth following. You guys have heard about the men of Galilee. You guys have heard about what Peter and Barnabas has done. You guys have seen what's happened to Ananias and Simon and Tabitha, Philip, and another Ananias. And now we're going to be focusing on Saul or Paul. Okay? Um, Saul, Paul, I'm going to use them interchangeably. Paul is the Greek for Saul. And so if you guys need to know that, I'm going to be using them interchangeably. Saul, Paul, just know it's the same dude. Um, but the first thing we need to know now is I've identified the character, the, the author of the story. I've identified where we've been coming in the story through Acts. And now we're going to go about the character himself. Who is Saul? Who is this guy? And why are we talking about him today? And oddly enough, the master storyteller tells it in, in a unique way. And so you see the conversion of Saul in Acts 9, but as we're going to get to Acts chapter 7 through the early part of chapter 8 is when we first get an inkling, just a mention of his name. And it's just a mention, but it's at the stoning of Stephen. So we're going to go here. And then they cast him, so this is Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When they had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entered their house after house, dragged off men and women, and committed them to prison. So who is Paul? Who is Saul? He's a Pharisee. He's a Jew. He's one of the religious leaders of the people. He held to the strict and binding elements of the law that you'll see in the Old Testament. And he was going to carry it out with no exceptions, as you guys saw. We see a man who's zealous, hard-nosed, passionate. He's not going to take bold from anyone. Let's see how he viewed himself in this time period in Philippians. So this is after his conversion. He's writing the church in Philippi. And he says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So this is him after conversion. He's talking about the church. He's saying we're not going to put our confidence in works. And now he's going to mention a little bit about, man, if he lived by the law, how did he view himself? How did he view himself now? He says, though I, ha- I myself have reason for confidence of the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence of the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteous under the law, blameless. So how did Paul, how did Saul view himself? Blameless. Blameless. Wow. Then, you see, Stephen shows up. And he tells him that he's not in his sermon. We see Paul, that in his view, he made it. He had everything under under control. He, you know, checked all the boxes. He had all of his ducks in a row. He had it all figured out. He had handled. He was good. Then Stephen shows up and starts talking about this resurrected king that the Messiah that the the Jews and the Pharisees have been waiting for has already come and died and risen again. And this guy is preaching to the Pharisees, Saul, saying, you're wrong, you stiff-necked man. And Saul and his companions, no matter how truthful Stephen was being, they couldn't handle it. 
They stoned him and they killed him, as you guys see. We could talk about all the reasons and the motives on why they would do that. We don't have time for that. But what we do know is that Saul could not handle his perfect little life being threatened. He was good. Everything was under control. He had the position he wanted. He had the status he desired. We'll just leave that there. Nothing was going to get in the way of that. I wonder, does this describe any of you? Maybe you come to church and you have the position you want. You have the status you want. Maybe you don't want someone getting in the way of that. You want this religion to make you feel good. You want to come to church and you just feel good. Feel like I, I did my deed for the day. Other than that, that's it. Well, that describes Saul. Or maybe life is not going the way that you want. And you're hoping that Christianity can just give you a little bit of control. A little bit of status. Maybe it can give you just a little of Jesus and all the other stuff. Well, it turns out that Saul, near the end of it, was kind of hoping for that too. See what, that, see what happened? See what that turned into? Murder. We're going to move on. So now we get to Acts chapter 9. We're going back to the storyteller, Luke. So over a, like a chapter later, 50 verses later. So he literally mentions Paul, says he approved of Stephen's murder. He approved his execution. He was ravaging the church. Bookmark. Then you get to Philip. Bookmark. So he says, you know, he just mentions he's kind of like a little, a little preview, like, you know, in one of those movies, and you just like you get a little hint, like a little foreshadow. Because Theophilus probably heard about Paul before this. But, you know. And then he just picks back up a little while later and he says, But Saul, that's kind of out of nowhere. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, the Christian movement, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. I'm going to stop there. Saul hated the Christian message so much that he was willing to travel to see it die. That's, that is nuts. Like, think about that for a second. Like, man, it's like Damascus is farther from here to Champagne. Man, he didn't have a car. <laughs> you know, they probably didn't even have bikes yet. And he's traveling all over the place to kill, to stop this Christian movement. To, it's done. He wants it to be over. He doesn't even want his thr- life threatened. He didn't want any of that. Isn't that odd? All right, we'll keep going. As he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. I'm going to just stop right there, too. What is so odd about that? Jesus appearing to Saul, the resurrected king. To Saul, who is murdering Christians, stomping out the way. And he doesn't say, stop killing people. He doesn't say, stop persecuting the church. He doesn't say, stop trusting in yourself. He just says, why are you persecuting me? What? Isn't that odd? He was doing some terrible stuff and Jesus doesn't tell him to stop. It's remarkable because Jesus makes it personal. Isn't that odd? Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that unique? That Jesus identifies so closely with the church, the believers, that their suffering is His suffering. And what a joy it is that we have a God who loves His church and His people so personally. The men who were traveling with Him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So he led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and either ate neither ate nor drank. So we see Saul running away, Saul trying to stomp it out, and then he meets the resurrected king. But there's th- actually three accounts of this in the book of Acts by the story of Luke. This is Luke's ha- account, and he wrote it, and he put it in the story just the way he wanted. And there's two other times where it's actually put in quotes this time, and it's Saul or Paul defending himself, one to the Jews when he's being accused of blasphemy, and one when he's standing against King Agrippa in defense as he's trying to say, I wasn't doing anything illegal. And so we're going to go to Acts chapter 26 and see Paul and his defense to a King Agrippa. 
and it says, I myself, so this is Paul in defense of himself, it says, I myself was convinced they ought to do many things in opposing the name of, the, of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to, put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So you see, again, Paul is just admitting to the fact so humbly, he's like, man, I couldn't handle this. I couldn't handle this. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. We'll keep going. And when he had fallen to the ground, we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I call to appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins in a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. There's one difference in this story that I want to highlight. And so it's not that there's two accounts, one's right and one's wrong, one's lying and one's not. Luke simplified it in Acts 9 and just said, hey, this is exactly what happened. But Paul goes into detail about what happened. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And some of you reading that are, would probably think, what the heck does that mean? What does kicking against the goads mean? Well, here's one Bible commentator on what kicking against the goads means. But before I read it, actually, um, goad is basically like a needle. It's like a, a prick that will go into an ox when it's treading grain. And so the Bible commentator says, it was hard for you to kick against the goads. It was a Greek proverb, proverb. But it was also familiar to the Jews and anyone who made a, living, made a living in agriculture. An ox goad was a stick with a pointed piece of iron on its tip used to prod the oxen when plowing. The farmer would prick the animal to steer it in the right direction. Sometimes the animal would rebel by kicking out at the prick. And this would result in the prick being driven further into its flesh. In essence, the more an ox rebelled, the more it suffered. Thus, Jesus' words to Saul on the road to Damascus, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. So what does that mean? This means that the message that Saul heard from Stephen and the stoning of Stephen had to make some sort of impression on him. Some sort of impression on him. There's some sort of Saul that was like, man, God, is this true? Maybe he questioned. We don't know. We don't know the details. But... The hard for you to kick against the goads makes it seem, from Jesus' perspective, from Jesus' words, that something was making an impression on Paul, and he, he didn't want anything to do with it. And the more he rebelled, the more and the more it hurt. The more it went deeper and deeper into him and his heart. He already had his life figured out. He didn't want to change. He didn't want to be wrong. He did not want to follow someone else. His life was easy. His was the way he wanted it. But God and his promises would not be thwarted for his chosen man to the Gentiles and to help spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. What happened here to Saul in Acts 9? What changed him? What makes him a transformed man? He met the resurrected king. We're going to move on to Acts uh, 9, 10 through 19. You guys have heard the sermon last week, so I'm just going to sweep through it quickly because Darren uh, preached on it already. Um, and then I'm going to just make one highlight before we move on. Now there's a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. At the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen him in a, vi- in a vision. And nam- a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may re- may- might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man and much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here is the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call in your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I just want to highlight this. The story of Acts that Luke is writing. 
You will be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Gentiles are non-Jews. People not in the people of Israel. The story is expanding. It's going outward. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. That must have been terrifying. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, again, with no travel, with no internet, with no YouTube, with no Twitter, no Facebook, you know, like, Saul had a reputation. Ananias and Damascus heard of Saul ravaging the church. He had a reputation. In that time, that is impressive. That's all I want to say. We're going to move on. In Acts 9, 20 through 25, and immediately he, Paul, Saul, proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who were called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving, by proving that Jesus was the Christ. And when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Paul didn't need to consult anyone as he wrote to the uh, Galatian church, <sighs> churches, he didn't need to. He just knew what he had to do. He had to tell everybody. And how did he prove that Jesus was the Christ? No video, no pictures, nothing like that. Eyewitness accounts in the scriptures. How did Paul prove that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God? God's Word. The Bible. God's Word, the Old Testament. Paul lived in the Scriptures and knew them like the back of his hand. I want to grow a Christian church. If you want to grow in evangelism, if you want to partake in the Gospel, reaching the ends of the earth, study the Scriptures. Prove that Jesus is the Christ. Paul was using the Old Testament. What excuse, is, what excuse have we? Moving on. And when, we, when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him. Now at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So what does Saul do here? <laughs> he went to go see the big boys. <laughs> you know, he went to the church. He went to the apostles, the foundation that Christ wanted to have for the church. So, what can we learn from this? You cannot, cannot function as a minister of the gospel without the backing of the church. It is a global movement, and it's meant to be together, not separate. So going back to this evangelism piece... Do you want to do it? you want to take part in the gospel reaching the ends of the earth? Read your Bible and, and be a part. Be about the church. Go to the Sunday schools. Go to the prayer meetings. Submit to your elders. Go to the elders. Talk to them. Ask them questions. Have them disciple you. Have them ask the hard ones. The hard ones you don't want to be asked. Partner with the church and read your Bible if you want to take part in this. God's asking. He's inviting you. And don't give up. You know, the church is full of sinful people like me. You know, ask my wife. Um, you're going to argue. You're not going to get along. You're going to disagree. Get over it. Now, let's see how Luke concludes this section of Saul coming to Christ. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and multiplied. So what he does after this, just to summarize it for you, bookmark, Paul's not brought up for another couple chapters. It's interesting how a master storyteller tells a great story. But what he does, what does he do? Luke gives a state of the church address in this last verse in Paul's conversion. Luke ends this section by commenting on it. And he says, and in Acts 1.8, remember the gospel, you're going to be the witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. 
and Samaria and to the ends of the earth? Well, according to Luke, at this point in the story, it's gone from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, and Galilee is actually on the other side of uh, um, Judea and uh, Samaria. It's spreading. And he's using an imperfect man, an imperfect man like me, an imperfect man like Stephen Stern, an imperfect man like Aaron, an imperfect man like Paul. And so what do we learn today from the conversion of Saul and Paul? We learn two things, and they're two big ones. What's the big deal? What made Saul, Paul, this transformed man? What transformed Paul from being a persecutor and a murderer? What transformed Paul from a life of power and control to a man who surrendered everything and loves and builds up the church whom he wanted to destroy, to stomp out, to kill? We see it sprinkled throughout the whole narrative that the author of Luke paints. And it's one simple thing that changes everything. And it's the sum of the gospel. Paul was transformed by the message he initially heard from Stephen, which was then confirmed by the revelation of Jesus to show he was a resurrected king and the Savior. That was, that's what's called a run-on sentence. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it again. Paul heard the message of the gospel and came to meet the resurrected king. That's what happened. He met the Messiah, Jesus and I'm, it's just there's a hint of that sprinkled in the narrative a little bit before we actually hear the first inkling of Paul in Acts 7. And so this is Stephen speaking when Paul is most likely in the hearing of it. And he says, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have betrayed and murdered. Stephen saying that the Pharisees, the Hellenists, they're the ones who killed Jesus. This is a, the death of the Messiah. And then a few verses later, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The resurrected king. Saul heard it, an inkling of it. But he didn't want anything to do with it. And then you see, Saul approved of his murder. Paul heard the gospel. He heard it. And he kicked against the goads. Which coincidentally... Paul must have been the eyewitness of this story that Luke records. There's two options. Some people think it was Philip who informed Luke of this story, of the whole sermon, word for word, that Stephen spoke. And some would say it had to be Paul and Saul. I don't know. But I'm becoming more, I'm more convinced as I'm reading the story that I'm pretty sure that that Luke was informed by Saul or Paul, the words of Stephen and what Paul did. That's a humble man who once thought of himself as blameless. In Acts 9, Jesus reveals himself to Saul as a resurrected king, and this changes everything. In Acts 9, Jesus reveals himself to Saul, and that changes everything. I had to say it again. Listen to what he says now, looking at his previous life when he writes to the church in Philippi. So we read the first half already. He says in verse 6, Under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Jesus died on the cross to save sinners like me, like you, like Paul. We can be counted as righteous in God's sight. We can be Jesus' friend. We can be in relationship with the God of the universe because he died and he rose again. Have you accepted him as your Savior and Lord? Have you? Have you, have you? Have you? Paul's around the scriptures. He heard the message. And I'm begging you, if you haven't, don't kick against the goads. Number two, what was Paul transformed into? One of the greatest evangelists the world has ever seen. Paul chose to take part in the Great Commission in bringing the witnesses, witness of Jesus' death and resurrection to not only Jerusalem, not only Judea, not only Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. Now let's listen to what he says when he writes to the church in Rome. 
In other words, which is a far, far, far place away from Jerusalem. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum I have found the fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard of him will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while." This is a transformed man who met the resurrected king, who made it his ambition to go to the ends of the earth. He wanted to go to Spain. Do we know if he made it? We actually don't. He wanted to go to Spain. And in his mind, Spain at that time, they didn't. that's on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. He didn't know there was something like America. <laughs> you know what I mean? He wanted to go to the ends of the earth. And he wanted to go where it wasn't proclaimed, where it wasn't preached. And he wanted people to come with him. And he wanted to partner with the church in Rome to send him there. What well, will you take part in this commission? God used sinful people and normal people like us for this mission. Will you? Will you talk to your coworker, your neighbor, your children, your siblings, your parents? Will you study the scriptures? Will you partner with the church? Paul counted everything as loss, and I hope on a grove, you do too. Now let's pray. I want to move on to part two in a second, which will be a lot quicker than this one. Father, I pray um, for this church. I pray that this would be a mission-sending church, that this would be a church that's missional, that studies the scriptures. I pray that if you met you, the resurrected king, would they follow you? I pray that they wouldn't kick against the goads. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, that's part one. All right, part two. And this will be a lot quicker. I'm going to actually pick this up now. Um, So if you guys don't know, I work for a college ministry called Campus Outreach. And what we want to do is we... Glorify God, we want to, by building labors on the campus for the lost world. And who is the team? It's Ashley and myself, okay? And this is who you're hearing about today. And I just want to go back to another Great Commission passage in Scripture. Some of you may have seen this presentation before. That's great. And it's in Matthew 28. And what does he say in Matthew 28? He says two specific things. He says, make disciples of all nations, Baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them everything I have observed. And everything that, yeah, yeah. And teach them to observe everything God has commanded. Sorry, I got that mixed up. And that's true in the household, in the workplace, in the church, in the nations. And I'm talking about the college campus. I'm focusing in on the college campus, okay? And so, um, we'll we'll move on here. Um, This is Timmy, all right? This is mom dropping Timmy off on his first day of college. Okay, and let's say mom and dad, you know, help him get his room settled, like it gets all put together, and uh, they go take him out to eat, and then they drop him off back home, and th- like as soon as they leave, as soon as they leave, and they drive away, Timmy is an independent on the college campus in the United States of America. And that's different, because before, the first 18 years of his life, he kind of, you know, had to eat what was put in front of him. He had to go to bed when he needed to. He needed to do the chores. He kind of had, so they had like, he was kind of told who to hang out with and when to hang out with them. But now, on the college campus, Timmy, he gets to eat when he wants to eat. He gets to eat what he wants to eat. He gets to hang out with who he, he gets to hang out with who he wants to hang out with. And he gets to do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do. He gets to go to bed when he wants to go to bed. Timmy is an independent. And this is a huge change in the life of a person. And let's see some stats by Barner Research about independence and about college students in the United States of America. This is about five or six year old um, statistics by now, but it's growing. And that the first one is 44% of Americans and growing are becoming post-Christian. What does that mean? That means that America had some sort of morals, values, ethics where they were approving of and not hostile to Christianity, Christianity, morals, values, ethics, where if someone wanted to share the gospel with somebody, someone would think honorably of Christianity. That's not, that is becoming drastically declining very quickly in America. And you're seeing that everywhere, everywhere. 
What else are you seeing? You're seeing 60% of people who grew up going to church for the first 18 years of their life when they're dependents on their parents. You're seeing three out of every five, six out of every ten. You're seeing them walk away from the church not one having to do anything with it. On the flip end, you're seeing 6% of people come to faith after 18. You guys see this? We're, become, we're in a culture that's becoming more and more hostile to Christianity and less and less people are about it. Less people are interested in it. And let's see what we're also seeing. Other statistics in 18 to 24-year-olds. You're seeing suicide rates skyrocket. You're seeing sexual assault and rape reports go up. You're seeing pornography being at an all-time high. You're seeing anxiety. You're seeing depression. You're seeing brokenness on the college campus and in this age demographic, my age demographic. Now, I don't know about you. When I'm looking at the world, I have compassion. I have sorrow for my own life, for the, the sin and the gunk that I've done. And for the things that I see. And when Jesus in Matthew 9, he looked at the crowds who were following him. He had compassion. And he would say he was harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We'll see this. And then he says to his disciples after he's compassion on the lost and the broken. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. His solution? Laborers. That's what fixes it. Meaning that whatever's happening now, in his mind, in Matthew 9, isn't working. He's calling for laborers to go. And he's calling for a church to form a team. And so in Campus Outreach, what we do in central Illinois is we partner with local churches, with local college campuses. And we send out a team of laborers to the college campus. And you're seeing that Grace Presbyterian Church, they go to Bradley University. And in eastern Illinois, they partner with Christ First Church on the highway. And you're seeing in normal, you're seeing them, they're at Christ Church in normal, and they go to Illinois State. And you're seeing us with Calvary Bible Church in Bourbon A. We go to all of that Nazarene University. And we go and we target the students who would never want to walk into a church on their own. We'll go to the next slide. Because at all of that, you're seeing that it's a Christian. It's a Christian university. Why, why do we need to go there? They, they already got something going. And you're right, they do. They have the all of that ministry, the, little, the first little bubble in there. They have, their, you know, they have their students that, that grew up in the Nazarene schools and in the Christian homes. and They're going to have Bible studies for them to get plugged into and feel like they belong. And that's great. Whatever they're doing, yeah, I'm excited about that. That's, that's fine. I'm not targeting those people. What about the Christian background people who grew up in, in moral backgrounds, ethics? You know, their parents maybe wanted them to go to a Christian school. Or maybe the, the student grew up in church and wanted a school with some Christian ethics. We're going to welcome those students into our ministry. We're going to establish them or equip them. Same with the all event ministry. We want to, if, they want, if they're interested and they want to come, we want to, we want to welcome them into our ministry. We want to teach them how to read their Bible. We want to teach them how to share the gospel. We want to teach them how to sh- share their faith with other people. We're going to welcome the two first bubbles. But that's not our target. Our target is the athletic teams. Why? And I am a chaplain of the football team there as a volunteer. Why? Because most of those students are not going to walk into a church on their own. They're not going to, if they see a, a flyer for a Bible study, they're not going to go. They're not going to go. They don't want to go. So most of the football players I work with don't even know that there's a chapel at the university. Most of them don't know that there's actually like a curfew. They literally just went there for their sport. I target them. And we're going to go to this next slide. So what's our strategy? What's my strategy? What am I doing there? What am I, what am I doing? What am I going there? I want to evangelize students with the gospel. I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to those students and teach them that how Jesus is the resurrected king, that he died on the cross, he was raised on the third day. I want to establish them in Christ. If they come to faith or they come into college as Christians, I want to teach them how to read their Bible. I want to teach them how to share the gospel with other people. I want to teach them to equip students, or I want to equip them to do the very same thing I'm doing to other people. I want to bring people with me to do the same thing. And then I want to expect, export them into the church, into the real world, wherever they go. You know, I, I want to export them into the real world, into the church. If it's just a college ministry to gain numbers, not a big deal. But I'm about sending people into the church. I want to send them into the church. I want to send them into the mission field. I want to send them to be pastors and missionaries. And what, like, you know, what, what's our tactics? What do we do? We meet a ton of students on Welcome Week, hang out with them, we do cookouts. You know, on football move-in day, on football, like football mini camp, I'm there, and I'm there in full. I'm at all the practices. I'm at the games. The coaches let me do that. I'm there. 
and I make friends with them. Actually, we invite them to our homes at the late hours of the night and hang out with them and have movie nights. And we do all sorts of things. And we do things, this thing called Journey Book. And it's like a five-week introductory study. And it breaks down the gospel section by section. Who is God? God is loving and just. What is sin? It's that we sinned against that. We, we weren't against our purpose. What did God do? He sent His Son to die on the cross. And what's our response? Accept Him as Savior and Lord or reject Him? That's the journey books. Discipleship groups. So if they become Christians or they are Christians, we put them in discipleship groups and small groups where we do the very same thing, the establishing, the, ex- the equipping, the exporting. And then we have a nine-week discipleship program in Tennessee, which is where I went a few summers when I was in college. And it's a nine-week discipleship program, which is full of a bunch of this. So we'll move on. And so here's like a bunch of pictures of a bunch of guys that I've worked with in the last few years. I just don't have time to tell you all their stories, but tell, I'm, I'm telling you all of them are great. I just want to highlight number 20, 29. So in the middle picture on the far right, his name is Xavier. He just got married. Okay, he just got married in Indianapolis last month. And he, can't, he didn't come into college as a Christian. Broken, broken past. Broken, broken family. Went to a Christian university just because he was like, you know, I probably should, probably should do something right since my family's a mess. You know, not a Christian. He becomes a Christian and he just got married. And he looked at me and he said, David, you know why I want to get married right now? I want to marry Megan because not one marriage and my family has made it. My mom, my dad have been through multiple marriages. My grandma, my grandpa, all four of my aunts and my uncle, all of them. Not one marriage has made it. Not one of them are Christians. And I want to raise up my kids, and I want to show to my family that as a Christian, marriage can survive. That's just one story. And there's many more to come. We're going to move on. So what's my role? What do I do there? I'm a campus director. And so I do those very things that I just told you that I do on the college campus. You know, I share the gospel with students. I meet them. I live life in them. I go to the dining halls with them. I feel super awkward and uncomfortable sometimes because I'm not in the same life stage as them. I, let's see, I, I li- yeah, I live life with them. I disciple them. I do those things. And I lead a staff team. So I'm not just a campus staff. There's a staff team. There's myself, a guy named Alon Cabese, and Valerie Thompson that are also on our team. And I'm the director of this team and how we function and where we target and where we go. And again, where I'm leading our campus is I want to target the people who would never go to church, who are not interested in Christianity, who don't believe in the God of the Bible. I'm, I'm going there and we're going there. And I'm in charge of local church relations, how we partner with our church and our teams. I'm going to be at the staff meetings. Like I'm very in and very involved with our church. We don't want to be a separate thing. We want to be a together thing. And I oversee the ministry as a whole on that campus. And that picture is um, the 37 students we brought to our spring break trip um, last spring. where We had 20 people who were Christians who were there, and then 17 were not. And one professed faith in Christ this last spring break in March. It was really, really cool. And so I wanted to give you some stats from this last school year before I close, because I've been talking too long. Um, Ten people professed faith in Christ this year. Ten people came into college, not Christians, and said, man, I think... I think I want to follow Jesus. And that's crazy. That is a high number, and I am pumped about it. Ten people. We had 30 people who heard the gospel on a relational one-to-one setting. And by not just me, by some students in our ministry who sat down and shared the gospel with them. That Xavier that I just told you who just got married, I was in the dining hall hanging out with some football players. I see him and Lucas, one of the other guys in our ministry, sitting in a far corner in the dining hall. And they're like, I, I go over them like, hey, Lucas, X, hey, what's going on, guys? And there's like a little notepad, and there's 14 names on the notepad. I'm like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, we're going to share the gospel with all 14 of, these, of our teammates by the end of the semester. And we're going to tag team it. That's what I'm about. Those guys, I'm, I'm about that. I'm, whatever that's happening, I'm about that. And they took part in a huge part of that number. And you're seeing 30 people in our ministry reading the Bible and praying daily. You're seeing they're sharing the gospel with their friends and they're attending our church. We have all three of these students are attending our church every Sunday. And and we we just graduate four students who came into college not Christians and who are going into the local church as we speak. And we have 17, now it's up to 20 students in Tennessee right now going to our Summer Mountain Project. That's what happened this year. And it's not because I'm awesome. It's not because I'm cool. I'm actually a little awkward. I'm not that awesome. But the thing is, God has been working on this campus where it seems like there's not a need, but there's a great one that's hidden. And we want to go there. 
And, we, and I, want to, I want this to be a factory of missionaries, of pastors, of godly moms, godly dads, godly parents, godly husbands, godly wives. And I want the world to expand, to explode into a revival of Christian movement. And so, why am I talking to you today? Partnering. There's multiple ways you guys can partner with us. One is prayer. We need people to join our prayer team. And we want people to pray for us a lot. If you join our prayer team, that means I would have your address and your email. And I would send you updates of what's happening in our ministry, like what's, look, like what's it looking like, how, what are we doing, and, how you, and people that you can pray for. And so if you're interested in that, we have a clipboard here that is up here. And if you guys, I would love your name, your number, your email address. I'd love for you guys to pray for us and to pray for us consistently. And two, as you guys can see, financially. Now, super grateful that you guys are partnering and wanting to do a free will offering for us, but we also look for monthly or annual supporters so that we can know year in, year out, month in, month out, what is our budget, what can we spend for our ministry budget and our finances, and for Ashley and I's own salary. Because we function as missionaries, meaning we raise up our funds as missionaries to go and to do our ministry. And so again, if you, were, if you were to give us one cent, that full cent, you would be trusting to us that we'd steward it well on our finances personally and our finances for our ministry. And we're looking for seven people to support us at 100 a month or 14 people at 50 a month. And I just put 100 a month to kind of give you an idea. Like you could be one of those seven people or you could be one of those 14 people to help us get her closer to our goal for this upcoming year and for the next few years of ministry. And so I ask and pray that you guys would consider it and help us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do I have to get the, the mail and the emails, or can I just... I mean, you can do that, too, yeah. How about, if you're, if you're interested in that as well, that's a good question. If any of you guys are interested in doing any of that, if you want to sign your name, your phone number, and your email, I will just tell you the directions on, hey, how does this work and what this looks like. And if you don't want to be part of the emails or anything like that, you can let me know, and I don't have to include you in that. And then the last thing would be referrals. If you guys know anybody else that's outside of this room that would be interested, man, I'd... I'd love to, to hear about it and hear who would be excited about it. But that's my spiel. That's it. Um, I'm going to pray, and then you guys will close. So thank you. Father, I thank you for this time. I ask and pray your name will be glorified, that your name will be made great. And that, Father, I ask and pray that your, your flag will be planted by the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.